what role can international labor standards and the ILO play in the protection of migrant workers' rights? So this is actually the question we will start to, uh, we'll try to answer today, thanks to the presence of uh, panelists and ILO experts. Good morning, good afternoon, Spalher, Spalnur. My name is Miriam Boudra. I'm Senior Program Officer at the International Labour uh, Organization, the Training Center of the International Labour Organization. And today it's my pleasure to facilitate this discussion on this very important subject. Um, without further ado, let me explain. We have uh, interpretation provided in English and Arabic. You can select directly the language you want to follow the discussion. And we have also the possibility at the end of the discussion with our panelists to answer to some of the questions. So please don't hesitate to use the Q&A for posting your questions and we will try to address them during the Q&A answer. Without further ado, let me give the floor to Ms. Mission Layton, Chief of the Labor Migration Branch for the International Organization. Uh, she directs the office work on labor migration and mobility and supports policies and programs related to migrants and refugees. Ms. Layton, thank you very much to be with us today for opening officially this uh, tremendous uh, webinars on the, uh, pro wages protection. The floor is you, Michelle. Well, thank you very much, Miriam, and uh, good afternoon and good morning to all of you, depending on where you're joining us today for this event. I'm really delighted to welcome you on behalf of the ILO to this important discussion. Wages are a critical issue for most of us here. Certainly anyone who's employed, I think it's fair to say that uh, all of us would like to receive fair wages for our labor. They're central as a condition of ensuring we have decent work along with health, healthy and safe working conditions and the respect for our rights in the workplace. We also know that the non-payment or delay of wages that we earn, unfair illegal deductions, affect the lives of workers very centrally. The ability to have food on the table, shelter for our families, and literally the ability to live freely and in dignity. For migrant workers, this deprivation can be exceedingly acute. Besides not being able to obtain basic services, the non-payment of wages can lead to debt bondage and forced labor to what we call modern day slavery. This is a particularly a particular risk for low wage migrant workers in an irregular situation, those who might be undocumented or working in the informal economy. And women migrant workers have an even higher set of risks. But migrant workers are often afraid to complain about the non-payment of wages for fear they might be fired or sent home or deported. So this actually escalates the impunity of the nefarious employer who would not pay their workers. And for the 169 million migrant workers around the world, wage-related abuses were already a major concern prior to the pandemic. Those in countries experiencing crisis or conflict may be forced to leave a country quickly they may be forced to return to safety, but with little means to acquire their earned benefits. We saw this happening again and again during the COVID pandemic. ILO research shows there are a number of reasons why wage theft, well, why wage protection and wage deductions, which are illegal, have become a growing concern, even as the pandemic has subsided. And I mentioned wage theft because a lot of governments are using that term, but the ILO really looks at this as wage protection issues. Migrant workers often face discrimination, xenophobia, racism, both in the workplace and in society. And this gives a license, if you will, to unethical businesses and employers to take advantage of these workers, even before they leave their country. Many workers are subjected to unfair recruitment processes, which can, for them, require payment of up to 17 months wages for their jobs. It can lead to contract substitution and to recruiters even negotiating the kind of wages and deductions monthly that employers will take. They face significant obstacles in obtaining equality of treatment and wages. On average, we know from our research in ILO that they're paid 
13% less than national workers for the same job. But for some, in some countries, it's the, the wage gap is over 40%. And it's worse for women migrant workers than for men. Now, governments around the world acknowledge these issues. They did this in their progress declaration on the international migration at the International Migration Review Forum at the UN General Assembly last year. They committed to enhancing international cooperation on the recovery of earned wages, on benefits and entitlements of returning migrants. But countries now need to implement this commitment and to step up their cooperation to root out these abuses. Let me end with a final note. People have migrated across borders and across regions for centuries. Most are searching for a better life, a decent job, safety and health for their families. And we also know that most migration today brings positive benefits to migrants and their families and to home and host countries. But this is only true if workers are protected, their wages are paid in full and on time and without fear of reprisal. The ILO's Protection of Wages Convention Convention 95 has now been ratified by almost 100 countries, most recently by Saudi Arabia. And this is a major milestone, especially because the majority of workers in the country are migrants. But there still remain too many countries where wage protection issues are not addressed and migrant workers need our help. For its part, ILO is expanding work in many countries to help with improve wage recovery, facilitate digital wage payment systems or establish other wage protection systems. And today I'm just delighted that ILO is releasing the guidance note on the protection of wages for migrant workers. This guidance outlines the steps that, that are needed to make progress in this area. So I think we hope that the discussion today will contribute to building a more inclusive, diverse and just society. And I'm really looking forward to this discussion and hearing your uh, inputs and experiences and sharing with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michel, for this very precise and concise introduction. I think we really capture, you know, the challenges and obstacles faced by migrant workers, in particular with regard of wage protection. You also highlighted the gender dimension we shouldn't forget about. And I think uh, you clearly mentioned the very positive role that migrant workers can play in host and also uh, society, but also in their home country, but they need they need wage to be paid fully. And it's great also to hear from you that there were so many interesting um, progress in many countries, but there are still obviously challenges. And I think uh, through this guidance note that the ILO prepared, there are very clearly uh, important progress that can be, uh, can be made in the, in the coming years and months. And without further ado, I think you very well introduced, we are here to hear more about also this guidance, the ILO guidance note. And without further ado, I would like to give the floor to uh, Ms. Catherine Landwitz, who is a senior specialist at uh, the ILO Labor Migration Branch, and who will in a nutshell as well, uh, go through this uh, guidance and introduce uh, the, uh, this, uh, this last publication. Catherine, uh, if you hear me, you have now the floor. Thank Hi. you. Good morning, Miriam. Good morning to you all. Good morning, Catherine. I know that. And good afternoon to some or many. And good afternoon as well to some and many of us, and particularly thinking of some of our participants also joining us uh, from Australia and Oceania. So uh, thank you very much for also being with us still today. Very late for them. So thanks, thanks for that. Um, I think my colleague Marion will share the screen and you will start your presentation. Thank you very much, Marion. Thank you. Yes. I hope it's fine. Uh, okay. So, yes. Like I said, good morning, good afternoon to, to all of you. I am as delighted as Michelle to, to be here to present this new guidance uh, from the ILO um, 
on wage protection for, for migrant workers. This is a very important topic. Um, before going into a little bit of the, the, the substance uh, of the guidance note and its structure, I would um, I would like to, to first say a little bit about the objective uh, of the note. Uh, and then going into the um, the full, I mean, the full explanation on, on what this note is about, uh, something about defining wage protection, uh, who is covered by wage protection in the context of ILO standards, and, and also elaborate a little bit on implementation and enforcement issues, which is, of course, key. Um, yes, next slide, please. And next slide. You can go on, Mario. Yes. So why did we do this guidance note? So what is the objective? Um, first of all, um, the ILO has opted a range of international labor standards on a variety of issues, including on wage protection. So one of the objectives of the note is, of course, to, to outline some of the key principles in these international labor standards. Um, and, uh, and link them specifically then uh, to the situation of migrant workers. Uh, because as Michelle was mentioning, migrant workers face uh, a number of wage protection issues, including non-payment of wages or systematic non-payment of wages even, or underpayment of wages, um, delayed payment of wages and uh, and so on. And, and this situation becomes, of course, particularly acute in situations of crisis where they have to, uh, to leave the country immediately and where wages uh, should be paid before they go or they should get them uh, upon return. But also this guide, we would like it to be a resource for governments, for workers and employers organizations, and, and also for other partners, for civil society organizations, for our partners in the UN, uh, for people in the academic world. Uh, so really a resource, but that would be a living document. And this is why this discussion today is also important to hear from the speakers and, and also from the from the participants in their questions, um, how can, can we further use this document and, and what could be some of the good practices that we could in, in, insert in those uh, to, make it, uh, to make it even more useful and, and also to add uh, if there's other questions. So next slide, please, Mario. So first, the first part of the guidance note really deals with how we define wage protection. And of course, the first step to that is what is in our ILO standards. Um, and there are a number of ILO standards that are relevant in this context. Uh, there are ILO standards that relate to labor migration. There are ILO standards relating to domestic workers or to forced labor. But the key international labor standards on wage protection are Convention 95 and its accompanying Recommendation 85. Those are really the the most comprehensive ILO standards in this uh, in this area, um, and they have a number of of principles that are outlined in the in the guidance note um, to deal with with some of the common wage protection uh, areas. And the guidance note, in that respect, um, talks about and and gives further information on on what, uh, how pay, uh, workers should be paid, including migrant workers. I mean, of course, they should be paid in legal tender and they should be paid on time and regularly because what happened often with migrant workers is that workers can be delayed uh, and migrant workers then have afterwards uh, issues to, uh, to recover. So timely and regular payment is critical for certainty and security of workers and their livelihoods. But also, Workers should be free to dispose of their wages as they choose. And the guidance also gives some further information on payments in kind, because in the context of migrant workers, what we often see um, is that a lot there, there are many uh, payments in kind in terms of accommodation and food. And the issue sometimes is that these are being undervalued. And what do the standards say in this regard? That in case there is payment in kind, that value should be fair and, uh, and reasonable, of course. But also, um, I mean, in, in just a little bit more on the payment in kind is that domestic workers are often 
uh, workers that are being paid in kind, and it's therefore particularly important um, that it would be covered by, uh, by wage protection. So the value attributed to such allowances paid in kind should be fair and reasonable, uh, and care should be taken that the value of in-kind payments, for example, accommodation and food, should not be undervalued. There should not be any unlawful deductions that are um, from wages. So some deductions are permitted, for example, those regarding to trade union fees or social security benefits, but there are other deductions that can be unlawful. And these are more, many of these are, are related, for example, uh, when deductions are being made for the purpose of gaining or retaining uh, employment, for example, when we talk about recruitment fees, if they are being deducted from uh, wages. But also the guidance provides some further information in, in case where the employer becomes insolvent. And in that case, workers, of course, they should enjoy a privileged treatment. They should be the first uh, to be paid in terms of their wage claims. And finally, and this has been very important in the context of crisis and, and when we look back at COVID, uh, is when, when migrant workers they terminate, they terminate their employment or when their, their, their employment is being terminated and they have to go home, of course, they have to receive the full and swift final payment of all wages uh, within a reasonable time. Uh, so when they terminate their employment and then Finally, it's very important as a principle that workers have the right to be informed of their wages. So the receipt of wage slips, for example, is, is, is key. Now, another issue that has been, been also addressed and, and, and which is, of course, uh, very much um, uh, of debate um, and, and a major uh, violation is, is, is the issue of forced labor and, and then to what extent non-payment of wages um, uh, can be a link with forced, forced labor. So when wages are systematically and deliberately withheld as a means to compel the worker to remain in the workplace and deny the worker the opportunity to, to change employer, then these con conditions may suggest uh, forced labor. So you can go to the next slide, uh, Marion. The next part of the, of the guidance deals with who is covered. So in the context of the ILO Convention number 95, all persons to whom wages are paid or payable are covered, should receive wage protection. And this includes migrant workers. But some of these workers are particularly vulnerable to wage abuses. And the guidance note goes into a little bit more detail on, on who these workers are. And if we look at, at those workers that, that may be most in need of wage protection are, for example, migrant workers in temporary labor migration schemes, which offer, um, which often very often pay large recruitment costs uh, to employers um, or, or their large, sorry, their large recruitment costs being paid by employers, but this creates also incentives for certain for certain to, to, to withhold wages or deduct some of these costs. Um, so they are particularly vulnerable and should be protected. But also migrant workers in irregular status. Yes, they are covered by wage protection and it's very clearly and also was being emphasized by the ILO supervisory bodies that whether or not you have a work permit or whether you are in formal or informal employment, you should have the right to wage protection and you're covered by the convention. Um, those there are migrant workers that work in certain sector or certain employment relationships that are not covered by labor law, and 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 more. And this is particularly the case for domestic workers and migrant domestic workers um, are a very important group in uh, in this context. And Convention 189 on Decent Work for Domestic Workers is actually extending the principles that are set out in Convention 95 for domestic workers, and this is very important. Uh, for this group. But other groups that are covered are, for example, those countries, those migrant workers whose country who contracts, employment contracts have been terminated. So like I said before, upon termination of employment, migrant workers should receive their, um, their, full, uh, their full wages. Um, and, and this should happen, uh, happen swiftly, of course. And, and finally, of course, Again, under the convention, migrant workers whose company becomes insolvent or bankrupt um, 
should be treated as privileged creditors uh, regarding wage debts in such procedures. So we can go to the next slide. And then a, f a, a final part, which is actually part three, uh, should be part three, is regarding to implementation and enforcement. And the guidance note emphasizes a very important role of the labor inspection in this context, because effective monitoring and enforcement is critical for the realization of wage protection. Um, a well-resourced and empowered labor inspectorate is key. Um, and this is especially emphasized in, in, in the ILO standards on, on labor protection, particularly Convention 81. Uh, but in that context, of course, cooperation with other relevant government departments may be necessary, but it should be ensured that such cooperation between the labor inspectorate and other departments should not jeopardize the situations of migrant workers in an irregular situation. So there are specific considerations for migrant workers, for example, low wage workers, low wage migrant workers, they may be more likely to be employed in sectors that are not covered by labor law and hence where generally effective labor inspection is, uh, is lacking. So weak, weak enforcement, um, weak enforcement uh, by labor inspection contributes of course to making migrant workers more vulnerable to wage related abuses. And it's important in this context, and this is very relevant to migrant workers in an irregular situation, is that the primary duty of labor inspectors is to protect workers. And of course, look at the implementation of the labor law, which also includes wage protection uh, provisions, and it's not to enforce immigration law. But workers and employers have also an important role in ensuring wage protection. Um, and government should make every effort to consult them and, and, and as far as possible to involve their direct participation uh, and, and have social dialogue. So unions can, for example, help monitoring the, the implementation of wage predict provisions and employers, they can train, provide training to companies on national laws and international standards and provide opportunities for dialogue. What can enterprises do according? To the guidance note, it elaborates um, extensively on, on what enterprises can do, referring also to the ILO tripartite declaration on multilateral enterprises and social policy, but also to due, due diligence processes and guidance on wages from ILO guiding principles on combating forced labor. And there is also the handbook on employers for, on, for employers and business on combating forced labor that sets out important principles and elements on, on, on wage protection in this context. Also, the guidance note provide a little bit more, more information on, on how workers can claim redress. It elaborates on the importance of access to justice and judicial procedures, state-based administrative of non-judicial procedures, and also state-based grievance mechanisms. In this context, there are, of course, specific considerations for migrant workers um, who may face legal and practical barriers to accessing justice mechanisms. And I think today we will also hear uh, more about that and what can be done. And for example, migrant workers in, under temporary labor migration programs, they can fear loss of residency rights. And there are also intersecting vulnerabilities that are involved. Migrant workers may also lack evidence like wage slips uh, and further hurdles in obstacles in enforcement of justice cross-border. And finally, something about the role of countries of origin in protecting workers' wages. And they can do this through, for example, engaging in bilateral labor migration agreements that have provisions on, on wage protection, attaching model contracts to those agreements, which have pro pro protective provisions uh, with respect to wages. They can engage in training and orientation or provide consular assistance um, and legal aid. And upon return, of course, collection of data on, on wage claims and the situation of wages of their, of their workers abroad is very key. So this is what the guidance note is about. I hope this gives you a sort of a framework for the discussion. Uh, and I'm very looking, much looking forward to the, to the panelists and, and the contributions they will make and afterwards to get the ideas on how we can further promote this guidance and, and uh, work with it and, and as a first step to further engaging on, the, on this very important topic. Thank you very much. Over to you, Miriam. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kat. And uh, without further ado, because I think we're running a little bit out of time, so I think you really make clearly the connection with our panelists. And um, I think what I hear in any case from your presentation is how this uh, guide is for different kind of actors and that we all have a role to play with regard of, of wages protection. And I think this is also with our panelists today and a practitioner and expert joining us for the discussion, what we will also try to see because they all coming with their own experience and we have a very diverse panel today. And I would like to thank uh, the, uh, the different guest speaker uh, for joining us today. Through the exchanges with them, we will hear from their experience what they have tried to implement at their own uh, uh, national or regional uh, level. And we have representative of government, social, so, uh, social, uh, civil society, employers, um, um, enterprise, and finally, uh, workers' organization. Without further ado, let me introduce our panel. Uh, let me start maybe with Mr. Uh, Robert Hall. He is Commissioner of the Wage Inspectorate Victoria, which is an independent regulator in Victoria, Australia. He is the head of an agency that promotes and enforces workplace law covering wage threat, uh, child employment, long service leave, and contractors in the transport industry. Thank you very much, Mr. Holt, to be with us today. Let me continue with uh, Ms. Irem Af. Uh, she is an experienced human rights advocate who work uh, who worked focused on defending migrants and refugees' rights. She is presently the Migration Policy Advisor and the International Trade Union Confederation. Uh, ITUC represents over 200 million workers worldwide through its 332 affiliate union organizations. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Arf, to be with us today. Let me continue with Associate Professor Bassina Fambelum, um, who is an international lawyer, academic and legal, uh, clinic legal educator, as well as a global expert on migrants' rights. She is the founder and co-executive director of Migrant Justice Institute, and she's also associate professor at the Faculty of Law and Justice of the University of New South Wales, where she, has, uh, she was the founding director of the Human Rights Clinic for uh, 10 years. And last but not least, Ms. Henriette Macoul, uh, who is a social in uh, innovation and human rights manager at Vinci, a world leader on concession energy and construction. With a background on social anthropology and after a number of experience in think tanks, NGO, and the European Parliament, she spent six years managing CRR on, uh, and workers' rights on Vinci's construction site in Qatar. She is now responsible for social innovation and human rights at Vinci headquarters, when her role is to deploy the company's social and human rights policy across all countries of operation. Um, let me maybe uh, start, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Holt, with questions uh, for you. Please tell us more about the role that the Victorian wages inspirate and uh, wage trade law, and the way in which the inspectorate promotes compliance and prosecute breaches, and what are the challenges in encouraging more migrant workers to report wage debt? What role do criminal sanctions play in changing behavior of employers? Mr. Hall, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. And it's a great pleasure and honor to um, be with you. And, and it's good evening from me. It's, it's early evening here in Australia. Um, as you noted in your introduction, Miriam, Wage Inspector of Victoria is responsible for regulating um, several workplace laws in Victoria, Australia, and perhaps most notably for this audience, Victoria's uh, wage theft laws. Uh, in the future, we'll also be responsible for some uh, gig worker support services. And so it's exciting to be moving into that space as well, where we know a lot of exploitation can take place. Just some background on Victoria's wage theft laws. In 2020, the Victorian Parliament um, voted on a bill that made deliberate and dishonest withholding of entitlements a criminal offence in Victoria. Um, of course, this has always been illegal in Australia, um, but it was a civil matter and therefore the penalties didn't necessarily match uh, the community expectations for how this type of dishonest practice um, would be punished. Um, for background, in Australia, we've seen several cases of, of big name respected businesses systemically underpaying workers and, and particularly migrant workers. 
So uh, when the new laws took effect here on, on 1 July 2021, this type of deliberate underpayment became um, punishable by up to 10 years in prison and fines of over $1 million. So in Victoria, it is now a crime to dishonestly withhold employee entitlements, to falsify employee records or to fail to keep records to gain um, a financial advantage. Um, the inspectorate, my inspectorate, promotes compliance and prosecutes breaches of the of the of the law, and we do this in a few different ways. And in fact, we rely quite heavily on the um, ILO strategic compliance planning model to do that. We use compliance monitoring. We prosecute before the courts, and we have a matter before the courts at the moment, which is currently the subject of a challenge. Uh, we use education campaigns, media, and public relations. Um, of course, our stakeholder relationships, and we use a lot of data and intelligence. To, to target our regulatory efforts towards high risk areas. Um, not necessarily in that order, but we use all of those things. Um, when the laws came into effect, we also ran a very big advertising campaign that focused on migrant communities as well as um, uh, native and, and English speaking communities. Uh, we reached over 70% of, of our target audience here in Victoria, and it was complemented by a lot of media coverage because these were the first ever laws in Australia of this, of this nature. Um, we leveraged existing government communication channels to culturally and, and linguistically diverse uh, communities, which had been built up to help distribute a lot of the COVID-19 messaging as well. So we had that channel to, to rely on. Um, we gave presentations to asylum seeker groups, migrant support services and international students, as well as to unions and business groups and, and in language groups who could help us present those uh, messages as well. So in, in talking to stakeholders who support migrants, we know that there were challenges in migrant workers reporting wage theft. Um, Sometimes that is they may be unwilling because they don't uh, trust government services or perhaps they'd be worried about the implications for themselves or their residency or indeed their, their safety and their welfare. Um, for example, if an international student has been working more hours than their visa allows, they may not want to disclose that for fear of ramifications. I'm not saying that that is um, rightful, but that may be a fear. Um, they don't want to jeopardise their... Um, employment and their ability to stay in the country. And some may be concerned that we would share information with other government agencies or the ramifications for their own communities. So those are all really difficult challenges to, to overcome um, when, when trying to get um, migrant workers to report this behaviour. Um, there are some high profile examples of systemic underpayment. I think the Australian community made up its mind that those penalties were not strong enough. And so criminal sanctions are really important part of Victoria's wage theft laws and, and the Victorian parliament made it, made it a crime and gave us specific powers to enter premises, to obtain information, to seize documents and to question uh, and to compel, um, to compel uh, witnesses to, um, to interview and to, and to answer questions as well. Um, I would just say as well that that significantly these laws also target the corporate culture of some of the employers. So um, the corporate cultures that allow or direct or encourage or tolerate um, the relevant conduct, the, um, the employing entity can be held liable at the corporate level as well. Um, I do think this is very transferable in, in a couple of ways. I mean, our approach to regulating has been replicated by some other Victorian regulators, um, particularly in the vocational education space. Um, and as a community of regulators in, in Victoria and, and nationally and indeed internationally, um, we're very we're very cooperative in our approaches and and the the um, you know policies and procedures that we that we undertake. Um, secondly, just with regards to the criminalisation of, of wage theft, since the Victorian laws were introduced, they've been replicated in other states. Um, Queensland has, has followed suit and South Australia um, uh, are intending to follow the same um, route. So I'll just finish by saying there's you know, no doubt there is a, an ideological um, element to introducing these laws and they're very focused on, on protection. And, and we know certainly that the migrant worker experience um, has, has particular layers to it with regards to wage theft also. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Robert, for sharing the experience. It's very interesting that we see how 
the, the, the specific role also played towards the employers and how, in fact, uh, we see how basically criminal sanctions are, are very important also in, in that specific aspect. And we hear also from, from you that it has also started to be duplicated in different states. So uh, there is a much, I mean, this is clearly a practice that clearly can, can be used and can be transferred in different contexts. So this is quite interesting also to, to hear from you. Much more from you in the Q&A sessions. So please uh, stay with us and, and thanks for sharing this very interesting, um, this very interesting uh, experience. Let me now uh, maybe move to our representative from uh, ITUC, uh, Ms. Arf, I think. Um, this is quite interesting also to hear from you the specific role that could be played by uh, trade unions. And can you maybe tell us more of the role that ITUC directly and the trade unions and your members, you know, can play in wages protection? Do you have some concrete example uh, from experience from your member um, and you want maybe to share with us today? The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Miriam, and uh, thank you also to speakers before me for setting the scene and uh, for all the interesting information. Uh, I think they're all all very connected. Um, for trade unions, wage theft uh, experienced by migrant workers is part of larger structural problems um, that render migrant workers all over the world vulnerable to uh, violations, which include wage theft, but but um, many others as well. Uh, so we. See see this problem not as something isolated that can be addressed when and where it happens, but uh, trade unions ultimately try to address the structural uh, inequalities, structural problems that allow wage theft and other abuses uh, against migrant workers to happen. Um, maybe also linking to uh, Robert's uh, presentation, uh, one of the key things we are pushing uh, governments to set up is the measures that truly disincentivize businesses that commit wage theft. Um, so the example from uh, Victoria, Australia is very, uh, very positive. Um, and, and also that then brings me, you know, to the importance of holding abusive um, uh, businesses accountable. And uh, uh, this brings the necessity of measures that uh, does not only hold the lowest ring in the supply chain accountable for wage theft uh, and other violations, but um, measures that bring the accountability uh, further up the chain. Um, on the migration side, we stand against uh, labor migration arrangements that restrict migrant workers' rights or lead to precarity, uh, some of which were mentioned uh, by both uh, Michelle and, and uh, later on. Uh, such uh, precarious status be it uh, relation in relation to the employment uh, status or because of migration uh, status um, force uh, migrant workers to uh, live in the fear of uh, constant risk of homelessness, detention or deportation. And um, we demand a rights-based governance of migration and coherence between labor, development, just transition policies and the migration policies. And of course, again, it was mentioned social dialogue and tripartism is really important in that regard. Um, wage theft is one of the most common and endemic factors of forced labor and uh, migrant workers are three times more likely to be in forced labor in comparison to their non-migrant counterparts. Um, I will provide some examples from uh, unions, uh, as you have asked, uh, Miriam, uh, but I see also amongst um, uh, the, the uh, participants, uh, um, my colleague from uh, BWI, Dong Tolentino, uh, and I know Dong and BWI have also been tirelessly working to ensure migrant workers' wages are protected. So I think it would be great if you could paste maybe some examples links to their great work, uh, which could be also interesting for, for participants to see. In terms of our and our affiliates work, I believe I can group uh, the engagement areas under two broad categories. Uh, one concerns the advocacy, so engagement in the design of related policies and legislation around those key uh, demands, which I have described uh, when I took the floor first. And the second area concerns direct interventions with migrant work. 
workers. And these include what we can describe as prevention measures, as well as measures to recover wages once the abuse has already taken place. Amongst the prevention measures, uh, we, we see our unions um, uh, providing information. This can be at pre-departure uh, level um, about the rights in the country of destination, about support structures so that uh, migrant workers can address when they face uh, abuses in the destination country. These can be unions uh, and where they don't exist, uh, other human rights organizations. At recruitment phase, um, interventions, uh, ensure you know our, our efforts to uh, ensure fair and uh, clear employment contracts amongst others and um again informing workers about their rights in relation to this but also monitoring the activities of recruitment agencies uh, we at I, at ituc um, with our affiliates in africa middle east and asia are running a migrant recruitment advisor it's a platform online where migrant workers themselves provide information on their experiences with the recruitment agencies they have worked with uh, and uh, this also of course you know they can learn from each other's experiences which uh, recruitment agencies are more trustworthy and this provides also an incentive incentive for for recruitment agencies to um, um, operate uh, within the uh, labor rights um, and and their obligations uh, and through this platform also migrant workers can seek assistance uh, when they face abuses. Uh, the, sorry, I, I hear a, another voice. C can you hear me clearly? We do okay. you hear you loud and clear, yes. Okay, great. Um, when we talk about measures to recover wages, um, we should understand the role these measures play in preventing wage theft in the future if the perpetrator can be held to account. So accountability is incredibly important uh, at this stage of interventions to bring about the structural change we want to see uh, so that the abuses cannot take place. And what I mean by such activities are example, um, helping individuals or groups of migrant workers to recover unpaid wages through administrative or judicial mechanisms, uh, as well as linking up uh, origin and destination country unions so uh, through cross-border solidarity uh, for for direct strike action or street protests or or by using media of course unions use a combination of these tactics and they use uh, direct interventions with workers themselves to build the basis of their advocacy work at national uh, regional and global level so the, the direct work on the ground is really helping us also push the demands I, I listed um, at the beginning. Some concrete examples, I'll start with the work of our affiliate DGB in Germany, um, which uh, through its Solidarity Center, Arbeit und Leben, uh, is providing counseling services to migrant workers in uh, 12 languages, um, of course, with full confidentiality and free of charge. And in only the city of Berlin, uh, last year, they provided counseling services to around 5,000 workers workers and more than 1,000 of the requests they have received for assistance concerned unpaid wages. Uh, this is very significant. Also considering, I mean, th there are of course many others, as, as Robert has mentioned, who, who fear coming forward or seeking uh, assistance as well. But through direct engagement with employers, uh, they gave a, uh, then managed to recover roughly 128,000 euros of wages um, in, in 2022. Um, as mentioned, one of the difficulties is the fact that migrant workers fear deportation, uh, detention, you know, when they are no longer in the country where they have worked, it's really difficult for them to pursue the wage theft claims. Um, in that case, for example, um, unions are trying to continue those claims, uh, even when the uh, worker has departed. Uh, so similar to the direct support provided in Germany, in Hong Kong, where there are around 300 migrant domestic workers, and largely, of course, women, uh, Pinai Care Workers Transnational has been training unionists to pursue wage theft claims on behalf of migrant workers who are no longer in Hong Kong. Uh, Pinai is a newly established transnational union of Filipino workers 
They are founded by eight unions in eight countries, and they are now trying to disseminate uh, this experience they have gained in Hong Kong to other countries where uh, Pinai operates. Um, but it's not just when the worker departs. Of course, unions are trying to ensure protections against uh, deportation when uh, workers are coming forward with um, wage theft claims or ab other abuses. Uh, for example, in the US, unions are requesting and successfully obtaining temporary immigration relief for migrant workers exercising uh, protected labor rights. So these, um, these relief uh, status are uh, protecting them against deportation uh, and, and detention if they are coming actually forward uh, for uh, the violations they are facing. And this is uh, happening through uh, the Injury to All campaign um, our affiliate AFLCO is, is running. Uh, I have uh, further examples, uh, but I believe uh, we're, we're uh, running out of time. Maybe we can come to them during the Q&A. Um, but just to conclude, I mean, in all of this work, uh, the ultimate goal of unions is to empower migrant workers, as only through that empowerment, the structural uh, problems, the structural inequalities that render migrant workers vulnerable to wage theft can actually truly be overcome. And um, organizing migrant workers, uh, which is the bread and butter of trade unions, and freedom of association and collective bargaining are, of course, key uh, in this regard. Um, I, I conclude uh, here, uh, dear Miriam, um, but I'm, I'm very happy to, to continue during the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Iram. It was very interesting to hear the different example from different parts of the world. And I, I, I take very much, you know, from your presentation. Well, obviously, first, a lot of uh, different practices and uh, experience around the world, whether it was in Asia, you mentioned USA, you mentioned uh, Germany as well, but on different areas. So we see, for instance, the importance of capacity building, training, uh, but also providing information um, and also uh, obviously the, the, the necessity of, uh, of ensuring as well that if irregular migration for migrant workers, for instance, are not fear of deportation. And, and you give also the example of how it is as well important to uh, temporary, this temporary protection that is needed uh, to ensure have access to, to wages protection. You mentioned it very clearly at the end, uh, the importance of empowering uh, migrant workers. And uh, that's, I think, is a very uh, essential aspect you highlighted through the different examples you provided. We will hear more from you in the Q&A. And obviously, I think as well, maybe some other uh, practices from you members. If you do have any links you want to share as well for more information for our uh, participants, please don't hesitate to share so they can also um, go in and, and look in depth about some uh, practices or experience from your members. Thank you again for sharing this very um, nice and, and also positive experience from uh, around the world. Let me maybe move to um, uh, Professor Bassina Fabemloum. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us. I, I think it's quite interesting because from your perspective, we'll also hear from first the researchers aspect, but also civil society, what is done. And um, can you maybe, uh, looking at, at research, please tell us more about the key finding of the global study of promising initiative in wage recovery for migrant workers that you conduced? And what are some of the promising practice, such as, for instance, the short-term visa that enable workers to stay in a country of employment when they have filled a complaint against their employers? I think this is, for instance, one of the, of the, the findings, but I let you obviously uh, tell us more about it. The, the floor is your professor. Thank, thank you very much, Miriam. And it's, it's a privilege to follow on from these speakers and always so heartening to hear Iram speaking about the wonderful work being done by trade unions around the world. Um, I'd like to begin by congratulating the ILO team on this very important guidance note. Um, it sounds obvious to state that governments must ensure that workers are paid the wages that they're owed for the work they perform. And yet we know in every country, as Michelle mentioned and our other speakers, wage theft is rampant and structural among migrant workers in a number of industries. We also know that every country has administrative and court mechanisms intended for workers to bring wage claims, but they don't work. 
and most underpaid migrants return home without having been able to recover the wages they are owed. The ILO has an important role to play in, un in underscoring that fixing this situation isn't just moral or aspirational, it's actually core to state's responsibilities under key ILO instruments. There's a fundamental problem that largely explains migrant workers' inability to recover their wages. And that is that the risks and the burdens of wage recovery lie with the migrant worker at every stage of the wage recovery process, from lodging a claim to obtaining a determination against an employer, and then when the employer doesn't pay, which happens very often, enforcing a judgment actually receiving payment. There's no doubt these problems are complex and fixing them is hard. But fortunately, it's not impossible. There are a range of concrete ways in which states can reduce the barriers that prevent migrant workers from remedying wage theft. And I'm going to share with you today some promising examples that we identified in a recent study that we conducted as part of a project in collaboration with the Solidarity Centre, ILAW Network and MIDEC. The report's available on our website, migrantjustice.org, and there's a lot more detail on these and many other examples. Very few migrant workers who are underpaid even get to the point of lodging a wage claim or complaint. In a survey we conducted of over 4,000 migrant workers in Australia, over nine in 10 of those who had been underpaid told nobody, let alone proceeding to bring a claim. There are a range of practical barriers to lodging a claim and many processes are inaccessible to migrant workers. In the report, we focus on a number of initiatives to make processes more accessible, such as increasing legal assistance to migrant workers in various ways and mobile labour courts that come to work sites such as in the UAE. But in the short time I have, I'd like to focus on another key barrier that's been raised by each of the speakers before me, which is migrant workers fear that if they take action to recover their wages, they'll lose their job and with it their visa and ability to stay in the country. And if they're undocumented, they'll be detected and deported. This is a key challenge in every country, but governments can reduce the vulnerability of migrant workers who bring wage claims through key changes to migration settings that allow migrant workers to speak up and leave exploitative employers without losing their visa and stay in the country to pursue a wage claim when they're no longer vulnerable to losing their job. Today, we released a new policy guide that sets out models and examples of how this can be achieved. And I think the link to that will go in the chat and has a lot more detail, but I'll briefly share some details here. First, sponsored migrant workers are rarely able to bring a claim against their employer because if they lose their job, they lose their sponsorship and with it their visa and they must return home. But in Canada, Finland, Ireland and New Zealand, exploited migrant workers are able to leave their sponsoring employer with an extended period in which they can stay in the country and work while they find a new employer and pursue labour claims. I'm also delighted to share with you that as of about five hours ago, Australia has just announced portability for sponsored migrant workers who will be given six months to leave an employer and find a new employer. We don't have details yet about the scheme, but it was just announced as part of a new migration strategy by the government today. Second, countries such as Hong Kong and Malaysia have short-term visas or permits that enable migrant workers to stay in their country of employment for a short period to continue to pursue a labour claim. Unfortunately, they're expensive, they're very short and they don't have work rights, so they're not really used by most migrant workers. But in Australia, we've led a coalition of peak national bodies, unions and businesses on a proposal currently before the government for a new short-term visa for migrant workers at the end of their stay who can demonstrate that they're pursuing a meritorious labour claim. Under the proposal, the claim could be certified by a national or state government agency, but it could also be certified by a trade union or a private specialist employment lawyer or legal aid lawyer helping the migrant worker to bring a claim. Third, as Erin mentioned, a number of countries have established protections for undocumented workers who pursue wage claims. In January this year in the United States, a new process was introduced for undocumented workers to apply for deferral of removal for up to two years if they can demonstrate that they are pursuing a labour claim through a range of federal, state or local labour enforcement agencies. This can come with work rights so the migrant can support themselves while they pursue the labour claim. In Europe, in the course of implementing the 2009 EU Employer Sanctions Directive, 
Several countries have introduced laws that allow undocumented workers to apply for temporary residence to pursue a labour claim if they've experienced serious exploitation, regardless of whether or not there's a criminal proceeding. In practice, the European options have been limited because they're confined to serious exploitation and migrant workers generally require significant assistance to apply for the permits. Further information on all of those is available in the brief that we released today. When migrant workers aren't able to stay to pursue claims, we identified several initiatives introduced to at least enable migrant workers to initiate a claim in the very short period before they leave the country. For example, in Israel, migrant workers are able to give advance testimony in person before a judge before they leave the country, which can then be used in their case once they've returned home. In the Middle East, migrant workers have been able to give power of attorney to labour attaches in diplomatic missions to pursue claims on their behalf. We also identified some promising initiatives to enable migrant workers to pursue claims from home by deploying technology, such as online courts and video testimony. These are essential and important advances, but they're not sufficient because they can only really be used by migrant workers who have help from cross-border organisations or as Iram described, collaboration between trade unions in countries of origin and employment. And there are some wonderful examples of excellent work being done by those organisations, but the number of migrant workers they're able to assist remains small because it's resource intensive. The small number of migrant workers who file a claim then face the next hurdle of proving their claim and getting a determination against the employer for the wages they're owed. In most countries, migrant workers bear the burden of proving that they were not paid, which is very difficult to do. We identified a really important set of regulations in Brazil, the EU, Israel, Belgium and Australia that shift the burden of proof from migrant workers to employers in wage claims. These laws create legal presumptions in workers' favour about the duration of the employment, the hours worked and the wages owed, which the employer must then disprove. Finally, the very small proportion of underpaid workers who actually obtain a judgment against an employer face further challenges because employers often simply refuse to pay or they declare bankruptcy. Here we identified a range of creative ways governments are compelling businesses to pay. These include licensing consequences in a range of US states, such as withholding or revoking a business license, deregistering a business or suspending job orders or trading until the business complies with a wage judgment. We identified further meaningful consequences for businesses that ignore wage judgments, like disrupting supply chains by prohibiting transport of goods across domestic state borders until wages are paid, or rapid accrual of additional penalties and fines for every day that the business doesn't pay and giving workers access to businesses' commercial assets to satisfy wage judgments. In a number of US states and European countries, um, there are also laws that hold companies further up a supply chain jointly liable for remedying unpaid wages. In short, the current situation is not inevitable and the ILO has a critical role to play alongside civil society, trade unions and business in deepening government's understanding of the problem and the reforms needed to fulfil states' obligations to ensure all workers are paid for the work they perform. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Bastina, for your uh, very clear presentation. I just want also to highlight it that uh, my colleague Sophia put the link of the study in the chat. So I really encourage as well participants to go in depth and have a look after the webinars. I, I think it's a very promising study and congratulations also uh, for the work you, you have done. I think what is very interesting when you mention and this is something we hear very often with regard of access to justice, is the challenge sometimes for migrants who have to leave the country and how ensuring once you leave the country across border that you can still have access to justice and remedies. And I think you gave, for instance, very example, concrete example, as you mentioned, virtual uh, court uh, that can be a solution. And also this need of collaboration and support um, from organizations that might collaborate together from the country of origin and destination to facilitate as well this, this access to, uh, to justice. So help 
through the, 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 uh, the, the borders is very important. And I'm quite sure during the discussion, we might come back to that. So thank you so much, Vasina, for sharing this important thought with us. And uh, we, we are looking forward to hearing more from you in the, in the Q&A uh, session in the moment. Let me then uh, give the floor to our last guest. And I think it's very interesting and that was necessary also during this webinar to give the floor to, to enterprise and to uh, employers directly. And for that, we have, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, Miss Makul Henriette from Vinci. And I think with her, we will hear very interesting experience uh, implemented by, by Vinci. Um, uh, Henriette, uh, Vinci has been a leader in developing local grievance mechanisms that extend to subcontractor workers that are also extended to subcontractor workers, which is quite also important in innovating, ensuring that such workers have extensive uh, accessible, um, that have a accessible challenge to raise and um, resolve complaint about wage up the supply chain. And can you tell us more about uh, Vinci and the work that Vinci is doing on ensuring wages protection uh, and in your project and also in different parts of, of the world. The floor is yours, Henriette. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for hosting this panel and congratulations for issuing this uh, guidance note and uh, for inviting Vinci to this very prestigious uh, panel. Um, a very brief introduction about Vinci. We have more than 270,000 employees in more than 120 countries. And while most of our activities are in OECD countries, uh, we also operate in countries where migrant workers or foreign workers are employed. So it's, it's, it's a key issue uh, for our business. So I will talk about three things. First, how wages protection is embedded in Vinci's human rights policy. Then I will describe a few concrete tools that companies can put in place and then if, if I have time I will move to some of the remaining operational challenges. Uh, let me start with the brief example of, of a case of wage theft which happened within Avancy a few years ago on one of the most uh, central metro station within the heart of Paris, Châtelet Léal. Um, we got to, well we heard in the press, through the press, that more than 20 Turkish employees had not been paid for months. Um, and these workers had um, met some trade unions who helped them make some noise about this case, which was quite uh, difficult for Vinci in terms of reputation, of course, but also um, it was quite costly because not only had we boost work case immediately by um, paying the salary arrears, of these subcontractors workers by hiring some of them directly or having them employed by another company and uh, then we had some legal um, costs as well to to in the proceedings with the subcontractor and all in all that cost the company a million euros um, so it was a good lesson for Vinci on how we need a lot more risk prevention regarding wage protection in our supply chain um, so a few things about how this question of wage protection has been embedded surely, um, gradually but surely in our human rights approach and HR processes. We issued five years ago a Vinci human rights guide, which gives very concrete and precise recommendation on wage protection. And this is being accompanied by a human rights performance evaluation tool that we deploy in our countries of operation. So we basically audit our subsidiaries, and that includes subcontractors and temporary workers. And so far, it's been deployed in 32 countries, 82 subsidiaries, and we have covered about 25,000 employees. So the questions and checks around wages and benefits are very practical. We, it's, it's actually, it echoes a lot what's in the, the guidance note. Uh, we ask about the frequency of payment, the means of payments, if the wages corresponds to the number of hours worked, and if this is detailed in the pay slip. Uh, we ask how the lowest wages are fixed in jobs. And we also ask if the wages are being reviewed regularly, taking into account the cost of living and in consultation with the worker representatives. So 
well, good news for us. It's it's really in line with the guidance note of the ILO. Now the, 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 the devil is in the details and we need to implement it more and to, to go towards a direction of more checks and controls in our, in our subcontracting um, chain. And we also have two questions which are very linked to wage protection in, in our internal tools. Uh, lots of questions about grievance mechanisms, about social dialogue, and, and about whether the grievance mechanisms are local and are directly accessible by, by both direct and indirect employees. Which leads me to uh, moving to uh, the tools uh, that businesses can implement to prevent wage delays or issues among their subcontractors, where there are the classic tools that you know, the contractual tools uh, that we can put in place with our subcontractors to insist on wage protection of workers, the social audits, of course, and I will focus a little bit more on local grievance mechanisms. Uh, we think within Vinci that this is um, that there are very good means to get early signals and early signs when there's an issue of delay of wages before it escalates, um, especially in geographies where trade unions and collective bargainings are restricted. Um, so in certain countries of operation, these grievance mechanisms are, are a legal requirement. In other, it's not, but we still encourage our subsidiaries to put local grievance mechanisms in place. It can be very simple. It can be having someone in charge, being a grievance receiver, who's being identified as someone who can collect the grievances of the workers. It can be done through campaigns, posters, um, through QR codes uh, that are accessible on site and accessible to everyone. And if this is being followed up, it's really good for employees to know that in case they can't solve an issue with their line manager or with their company, they have a plan B. And we as um, um, uh, general contractor and as the, 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 the lead employer, we can use our leverage and our contractual leverage to very early on uh, push the subcontractors to just abide by the law and, and, and pay their and pay their workers on time and in full. Um, now this is not really a concrete tool that it's moving on, on on more general issues, but companies will be much better at protecting employees, obviously if the labor inspection system is working. And very importantly, if there's a minimum wage system in place. Um, I met in the plane the, um, a few weeks ago, a Ugandan maid who was on her way to Saudi to work for a family in Riyadh. And she told me by WhatsApp um, um, two weeks ago that despite her contract mentioning that she should get 1,500 Saudi riyals a month, after her first, first month of work, she only received 900 by her employer. But this is not within Vinci, this is, this is external, but when she, complained and showed that contract to her employer, she was told, this is impossible. This must be a computer mistake and a black maid cannot get that much. So like it was said by some of the panelists, it's, it's often mixed and combined with issues of, of racism, discrimination, and it really helps companies when they arrive in a new country or, in a, or in a, when they operate in a certain context, when there's a minimum wage in place, because at least it's not contest, contestable. And um, that leads me to the uh, third point of, of uh, my short presentation about the remaining operational challenges. Um, I will talk here about our sector, the construction sector and model is not easy because of the duration and nature of the projects, which are very often limited in duration. And because we work constantly in new locations with sometimes new subcontractors, and in places where enforcement of the law can be limited, um, it's not always easy to have the leverage to change or impose things. So that's why it's really important to work in collaboration with international organizations, with trade unions, and to have this dialogue, because I think that it's a combined approach will work. Um, on the issue of insolvency, I think it was very useful for, for me and for us uh, within Vinci to read this guidance note. I think we need to be even more clear in our contract requirements about the fact that workers um, and subcontractors workers need to be the privileged creditors in case of insolvency. I think this is in the practice already of Vinci, but it needs to be formalized and it needs to be um, 
uh, a lot clearer in our in the way that we contractualize with our subcontractors, and we need to go in that dire in that direction of more control. And one last operational challenge that we have is to uh, do a lot more uh, uh, sensitive, well, raising awareness with our operational people to, around the notion of wage um, to basically. Uh, all understand that wages need not just to be defined just according to the market or just to the law, but according to living and, and decent standards. So I think the next big challenge for companies will be to, to reach living wage for our direct employees and also our, our indirect um, workers. And, and that, that will take time, but it's, it's, uh, it's definitely the direction that, that we need to, to take. Thank you very much. Merci. Thank you so much, uh, Henriette, for, for your uh, contribution. I think it's, it's very, you mentioned something which I think is very important. The contract, contractual leverage that a company such as Vinci has. And I think it is obviously very challenging because we hear from you uh, that it's not only obviously about you direct workers, but also uh, the subcontracted workers. Um, but you highlighted very clearly at the end, even if the the, uh, the path might be long and it might take time. Uh, there is a very important need to, to raise awareness and, and very much reinforcing uh, the, 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 the discourse the, uh, with regard of uh, the importance of uh, wages protection. So um, it's very interesting hearing from you as well the effort made by the private sectors uh, to do so. So thank you very much for sharing uh, with us the experience of Vinci and all the effort uh, that you're taking. I mean, being a leading company, it's also clearly eyes are on you and, and it's also therefore providing um, a good example and inspiration for other uh, other company as important or maybe even uh, smaller than than Vinci. So, so thank you very much for sharing that uh, with us today, Henriette. Um, we do have many questions. It's now time for um, asking some of the questions that we received from uh, our participants. I've seen that some of our panelists already started in the Q and A to answer, um, but, uh, written to the the, the questions asked by our participants. I'm also encouraging again, participants, if you still have questions, we are now having 20 minutes of discussion with our panelists. And I will maybe start with some questions uh, for you, Robert, that we receive in the Q&A. The first one uh, was from uh, Niha uh, in asking you uh, to, if you can uh, touch upon under reporting on wages theft by migrant worker students as a challenge. Um, are there any measure being taken to ensure no retaliation when they reported cases? Well, thank you. That's a very good. That's a very good question. Um, there are a couple of um, protections, and I'm sure um, my colleague Bessina would probably know um, about these as well. There are some protections for migrant workers um, who come forward and make um, claims of wage theft, both with with our agency and at the civil jurisdiction. Um, one of those is that making such a claim um, under the federal jurisdiction is indeed a protected action. It is a workplace right and. Um, an, an employee, be it a migrant worker or otherwise, cannot be um, discriminated or have their job um, altered for doing so. Um, of course, these protections, um, you know, they, they exist, but they are not always complied with by unscrupulous employers. In, in, um, in addition to that, there are some cooperative arrangements between the state and federal agencies and indeed um, agencies that deal with um, visa holders to ensure that visa holders are not, um, they don't have their status disrupted by bringing a, a wage claim and we are a party to those agreements as well. Um, in my agency, the other additional thing we have is we have the ability for people to report cases of wage theft anonymously. Now, this has um, a challenge because on one hand, that brings forward um, complaints about wage theft that we might not otherwise know about. But the challenge on the other hand of that is that if we are to take a matter forward to court and bring a criminal prosecution, then of course there is a high standard of proof that is required to bring a matter forward. And that may include um, witness testimony. And it is very difficult um, 
to bring forward witness testimony anonymously. So there are some protections in place, but there certainly are, are challenges. And if a matter is to proceed to prosecution, indeed, those challenges are, are even greater. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Robert, for answering uh, to, to the questions. Let me maybe move to uh, questions we received for, um, I would say, for IREM. Um, so I just want to ask you, that was a very interesting question from a colleague from uh, uh, MFA, uh, with regard of um, um, the, if, if someone complaining about not getting their salary, where they are working in destination country, um, as a um, um, MRA coordinator in origin country, how can uh, we help them to solve the, the problems? Uh, thank you, Miriam, and thank you to the uh, to the person who who posted the question. Uh, yes, I mean, I as I have mentioned, it's really important to ensure uh, cross border solidarity, cross border work between trade unions, and we are investing more and more in this, uh, both under the recruitment advisor um, platform, where we're trying to link uh, unions in in origin and destination countries, um, but also uh, outside that that framework, we have, for example, um, a memorandum of understandings uh, signed between um, our affiliates in Nigeria and uh, our affiliates in uh, Bahrain to uh, support and work together uh, to ensure migrant workers' rights in Bahrain from Nigeria are upheld. Um, similarly, we have uh, similar uh, agreements between union in um, Kenya and Lebanon. Uh, and, and particularly focusing on uh, domestic migrant workers. So um, it is challenging, uh, but uh, I think um, as trade unions, we, we, we know how to uh, face challenges and, and not give up. Um, and I think uh, we have a good network of uh, unions uh, in, in many of these uh, origin and destination countries. And it's really important to find ways of uh, connecting them together. Um, uh, and I think this is also important when uh, when we talk about, for example, the global supply chains, where uh, you know the the, uh, the direct responsibility even may not be uh, found uh, in in the country of origin or the destination, and and could be completely somewhere else. So this connection and cooperation between uh, trade unions uh, globally uh, is is very important. Um, I mean, uh, Miriam, I don't know uh, if you saw, but I saw also a question um, concerning um, whether trade unions, um, whether migrant workers' rights are important for trade unions um, and uh, whether their wage um, theft is, is something that we we care about. And I would say uh, definitely. I mean, a worker is a worker, as I think uh, I mentioned, regardless of their origin or their status. And when migrant workers are exploited or denied their rights, um, uh, this has an impact on all workers. And wage theft um, and other violations uh, against migrant workers depresses wages and working conditions for everyone. And we know this um, and, and has consequences for non-migrant workers as well. Um, so this is definitely something uh, we care about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for, for that, Irem. I maybe want, uh, Basina, uh, can I ask you um, if you might want to complete, because there was in the question highlighted this very important aspect related to um, cross-border. And this is also something, you know, that was very much highlighted in your study, if you might want to complete. And if I may, uh, as well, uh, asking you a kind of second questions on that, uh, if you think uh, that remain important bottlenecks uh, in the initiative of rage uh, recovery highlighted also uh, in, uh, in your study. Sure. So I think uh, I mean transnational claims are very challenging, and I think that we're seeing some advances by states in terms of the mechanisms around technology. Um, but it still remains very important that migrant workers initiate the claim in some way before they leave. It's very difficult to do that once they have returned home, and I think the challenge remains that 
countries of employment and countries of origin are not providing the resources that migrant workers need to actually be able to bring these claims once they go home. So even if they're creating the infrastructure and the systems to do that, it still falls to trade unions and civil society to actually help those workers to bring those claims. They can't do it on their own. And so states really need to be thinking about what resourcing has to come with those systems. Um, and I, I guess your, your final question around what bottlenecks remain. I think there are three key issues here. One is still a profound lack of understanding of the problem by government. There's almost no research done on migrant workers' experiences of trying to recover unpaid wages in any country. Um, we've done some work on this, but there are very few studies available. And so most governments don't actually fully understand the problem that they're trying to address. And so obviously trying to come up with solutions when you don't understand the problem is difficult. Um, and so does, the second issue I think is really designing effective solutions. And part of the issue there is around um, learning from what's happening in other countries. There's very little transfer of information around what other governments are trying, what's working, what isn't working, what are unions trying, what are civil society trying. Um, and so until now, it, this has been a very domestic issue. And so we need to see a lot more exchange of information and ideas and thinking collaboratively because these problems play out in the same way in so many countries, and yet we're not sharing lessons learned or ideas at all. Um, finally, of course, political will. Um, governments need a reason to do something about this. And so there, there is a real opportunity, I think, for unions, civil society, the ILO, and, and those businesses that are trying to do the right thing to come together to demand that governments reform laws and policies and institutions. Um, because if we just keep doing the same thing, we're gonna have the same problem. We need structural reforms. These are structural problems. And we need to create the political will within government to actually start to move on that change. Thank you very much for, for, for that. And I think you, you, you clearly mentioned the, the, in fact, the political will, which is at the center, if I might say, and, uh, and it's important also to, to mention. So thanks for, for, for that. Let me, before, I have a question for you, Henriette, but maybe before I, I want to go back to Robert and um, um, ask you maybe two joint questions together. Can you give some example of, of cases brought under the Victorian legislation, cases that were successful or unsuccessful as well? And um, last question, I find quite interesting as well, coming from our colleague Deepa, on to what extent the mandate of the Victorian wage inspector covered as well uh, inspection of a household and therefore um, uh, migrant domestic workers? Thank you. Th those are um, two very good questions. I'll start with the, the first one. So the Victorian laws um, have have only been um, effective for a short time, a little bit over 12 months. Um, we have one case before the courts at the moment, and I can tell you a little bit about that case because it is quite interesting. It's a It was a case in the hospitality industry, and it involved um, young workers, workers who, in our view, were um, vulnerable due to their due to their age and relative inexperience in the workforce. They were they were involved. They were employed in a hospitality business, in service roles, in front of house roles, and and back of house roles. Um, we took this matter to court on the basis that we alleged that the um, employer uh, knowingly um, withheld and underpaid these employees and and we allege that in fact this employer um, knew what the correct um, rates of pay were to be paid and and indeed um, deliberately and dishonestly did not make those payments um, the interesting aspect of this case of course um, being the first case it is in effect a test case and um, this matter has been challenged and in fact will be challenged in Australia's High Court, which was um, perhaps not an unexpected outcome of putting a matter like this into court. But my view is um, the legislation um, has been passed by the parliament and, and myself as a, as a regulator have an obligation to bring this matter forward. But it will now play out in the High Court. Um, the reason that it will play out in the High Court is because the challenge, in fact, is not being made to the facts of the case that I have brought forward, 
the challenge is being made to the validity of the state of Victoria to be able to make these laws, given that there are uh, Commonwealth laws in place. So I won't go into the um, broad technicalities of that, but it, it's a very interesting case, and I can certainly um, provide some some information in a, in a link about it. I think your second question, um, Miriam, was about our jurisdiction in um, households. Was that was that correct? Yes. Yes, exactly. And how, uh, if therefore, it's also it's also protecting and covering um, migrant domestic workers. Yes. So. Um, Anyone in an employment relationship falls within the jurisdiction of, of Victoria's Wage Theft Act. Now, determining an employment relationship um, in, in um, Australia's industrial relation laws can sometimes be difficult, but generally speaking, if there is a relationship of employment, whether or not that is being undertaken in a domestic household or, or another premises, if there is work being carried out in an employment relationship, then we do have jurisdiction. We have quite serious and strong powers um, in the wage inspectorate and we have been utilising those powers including um, issuing and executing search warrants, um, entering premises um, without consent and, and with the assistance of police in some instances and um, seizing information including electronic devices um, on the spot. So we have been using those powers, we have been entering premises, we have been um, executing warrants with the assistance of police on occasion, um, including on domestic households. Um, so I think my short answer is yes, um, my longer answer is the one I've just given. Thank you so much, uh, Robert. I still have um, a question for, for Henriette. Uh, you might have seen in the, the QLA, um, uh, Ray is asking if you, if you can maybe say something about agreements on, uh, of pay when paid and its effect on uh, wage protection. I will try. Um, that I know that some companies apply that principle, but this is really not part of the of the of the Vinci processes. Uh, the general rule is just to abide by the law in terms of payment of um, contract service providers. So generally, uh, and all our contracts are that way. Uh, we just abide by, by and in in um in certain countries where we know that some of our uh, partners can can have um, uh, cash flow issues, we often give uh, uh, advance payments to the subcontractors for their operations. Uh, that being said, in 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 practice, it can be challenging um, when our own clients are paying us late to ensure that all our supply chain is being paid on time. But um, certainly uh, the wages are the priority and then suppliers come later. So that I have seen in practice. I don't know if it's formalized, but this is really part of, of INC uh, culture and strategy. I, I, I've read a lot about this pay when pay uh, system. I, I'm not a specialist because I don't know how 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 it works. It's, it's certainly not... Um, uh, not the model that we adhere by. And as I said before, I think we need to be even clearer in and even more innovative in the ways that we can set up uh, with our subcontractors to have some leverage. Uh, I think we need to progress on redress mechanisms and also on setting up. It's not always easy to do, but but perhaps we, we could try more to, to put some insurance funds at the start of the contractual relationship um, or to withdraw some uh, uh, some of our payments, and, and, and I mean until the, the workers have been paid, or or in order to have a fund to take into uh, to to correct the the, the, the potential wage uh, wage theft, that could be a good uh, deterrent. Thank you, thank you so much, Henriette, for this um, uh, very interesting proposal, and indeed um, that could be a solution to have this kind of. Uh, uh, funds for ensuring uh, as well uh, wages protection for for a while. I, I just have maybe a very short question for you, and that would be the last of uh, questions uh, in our Q and A uh, sessions. 
Um, this, Vince is a member of uh, Building Responsibility, an industry group which developed workers' uh, welfare principles. Um, and that also includes uh, wages protection. Can you maybe tell us more about these uh, workers' welfare principles? Yes. Um, building responsibility is a sectorial collaborative initiative of uh, businesses. And the, the goal of that initiative is to basically raise the bar in terms of, of workers' welfare and workers' rights standards in the construction and engineering industry. As of now, we have um, 15 board members, and that represents about 1 million employees. And a few years ago, we worked together and we issued our worker welfare principles. It's a set of 10 principles that serve as a global best practice recommendations on worker welfare. And they've been developed by practitioners in the sector with the review and support of external stakeholders. They're available in many languages. And we, we try to cascade them down in our, in our supply chain. And one of the principles is, is on wage protection. So this is clearly identified as a, as a key issue. And I will also mention a few other coalitions that Vinci is, is um, part of and who work on the issue of wage. It's obviously, the UN Global human rights group we see we are members of that initiatives too and uh, we work with an NGO for on the living wage issue called the fair wage network thank you very much Henriette for for that thank you for joining as well and I would like if I may uh, take the advantage to maybe thanks all our panelists Henriette Robert uh, Bassina Irem for uh, sharing your experience and uh, your thought during this, this webinar. Hopefully not the last one on, on wages protection. I think it really had the advantage of showing uh, some practices happening in different parts of the world. So um, that was very interesting to hear from you, expert and practitioner on that area. Without further ado, looking at the time, it's 11 uh, a.m. in Turin. I will give the floor to uh, my colleague, uh, Patrick Belser, who is a wage specialist. He's a senior economist at the International Labour Office in Geneva, and he leads the work of the wage group and its principal. He's also the principal editor of the ILO Global Wage Report, uh, which is a flagship ILO report published every two years on the questions related to wage protection. Patrick, you have the very difficult uh, role to close uh, these uh, webinars and to provide in five minutes maximum, some closing remarks. Uh, I will give you the floor. Thank you very much, Rousseau Patrick. And again, thanks to all our panelists for joining us yes. today. Yes, thank you very much, Miriam. And, and thank you to all the panelists. Uh, it's been a very rich uh, discussion. I think uh, we are running a little bit late uh, on the time. So let me just join Miriam in, in thanking the panelists very much. I think it was an extremely rich discussion, very interesting. Uh, we've covered a very wide uh, areas of, uh, array of situations and uh, examples and responses in, in the area of uh, wage protections. We, I think, uh, at least for me, I've taken a lot of notes. I've heard many concrete examples and also many new emerging ideas that were put uh, forward on, in the discussion. And certainly all of these show the or reconfirm the importance that uh, uh, that wage protection has for decent work agenda and the uh, implementation of social justice. Um, it is clear that uh, without the uh, implementation of timely, complete and transparent wage payments, uh, decent work and social justice remain very theoretical. So you can have all the best uh, regulations in the world if they are not enforced and if workers are not getting their wages paid in full and paid in time, then um, th we will still continue to have a very serious decent work deficits. So I think we have also heard a lot of um, the, a lot of diversity in these uh, in these uh, wage protection um, situations uh, along a spectrum that can range from late payment of wages to unlawful deductions, uh, the undervaluation of in-kind payment, and at the more extreme uh, situation, the, the deliberate and systematic underpayment of, of wages and how 
Uh, this has been criminalized in, uh, in the state of Victoria, for example, I think it was very interesting. Um, but of course, not everybody, uh, not all situations of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the lack of wage protection result in forced labor or very extreme situations. So we have also uh, heard and learned a lot about what governments and social partners can do to, to reduce the vulnerability of the migrant workers who launch uh, complaints and uh, to to protect these workers when they when they launch complaints and maybe to extend their uh, stay in in the countries even uh, when their visa expires i have no time to go into the of course into the whole uh, very rich uh, list of of measures that were discussed but i want to say we have taken good notes of of these discussions and uh, of all of these ideas now uh, in in one minute uh, you know what comes next for us so clearly we intend to disseminate this guidance note as as widely as possible to translate it and uh, hopefully to complement this note with some training uh, material that uh, that we we have also developed on other wage related issues like minimum wages gender pay gaps uh, collective bargaining over wages for doing this we would like to collect more information on approaches and experience on what works what has worked, what hasn't worked, and make them uh, much more widely available to our constituents uh, and our member states. And uh, here I, I agree with Basina's comments that we need to be sharing the lessons learned much more widely and, and disseminate them. And so we are also creating a, a new thematic wedge page, a web page on wage protection uh, on that you will find if you type ILO slash wages into a search engine and we intend to populate this uh, this wage page with a lot of the uh, tools and uh, the, um, the the forthcoming documentations uh, that uh, we are going to produce on this matter on this website you will also see that uh, that there are some ilo briefs for example on wage protection in case of enterprise insolvency and also some of the analysis that we have done in Qatar and other places. And we really want to uh, make this issue uh, wider and, and a bigger priority in our wage related work in the future. So with that, I will stop. And uh, I think I will leave it to you to close this very interesting session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Just for the information of a participant, I just put the link of the, the, the ILO web page you, you mentioned. So or really engaging uh, participants if they want to have more information to go and click on the on the page. Um, thank you again to uh, to you, Patrick, to our panelist, uh, Michel, and I would like also to thank Kat, who made a very good presentation at the beginning. If I may, uh, a big warm thanks also to the whole team behind the effort and make this uh, webinars possible. I would like to thank uh, Sophia, who wrote a lot of uh, messages and he's the, in a way, if I might say, the brain behind the organization uh, of this webinar. So thank you very much, Sophia, and the team in Turin who made it also possible. Marion first, uh, Akim, Isham, and Alessandro uh, as well. And finally, and not least, obviously, our interpreters who made uh, as well uh, possible for Arabic speaking participants to join and to hear from you. Thanks to all. I uh, wish you a very good continuation and of the evening, depending on where you stay. And we keep in touch for upcoming webinars on, the, um, in my case, protection of migrant workers, but certainly any other issues related to ILO mandates. Thank you all and have a good day. Mm -hmm.